Okay, we are going to be talking about the U.S. barriers to soccer here today. Uh, this is a topic that we're going to approach from two different angles. One being the national team game, which would be like the World Cup competition and the U.S. national team and the popularity of the U.S. national team. Secondly, the club side, which for us in the U.S. is Major League Soccer or MLS, as we know it at the premier level. I do have my green shoes on. Um, I'm ready to roll. Hopefully you are too. I think this will be a topic of interest to many of you that you could have your own thoughts on and will hopefully share uh, on our discussion boards or via other means uh, as we discuss course content. Let's kick this off with the national team game and the authors in the Gaming the World book uh, for the, in the reading assigned to correspond to this discussion talk about the Olympianization of U.S. soccer. So, so what do they mean by that, Olympianization? Uh, besides being difficult to say, the meaning behind that is something that the United States or we as a country, sports fans in this country in the U.S. get excited about every four years, right? So the Olympics come around, we get excited about swimming, we get excited about track and field, we get excited about uh, some other event skiing in the Winter Olympics or bobsled. But those are sports that we're not too inclined to be interested in between Olympic years. So we get excited every four years when it comes around. So what they're suggesting is not necessarily that we get very excited about soccer as part of the Olympics, but that it's a sport that we as fans in the U.S. as a sporting culture only get excited around the World Cup mainly uh, in every four years. And then that creates a challenge for the professional organizations uh, that, that are clubs or franchises as we have them here in the U.S. to create excitement around the game of soccer in, uh, in between the World Cup years and excitement around the club game and not just the national game. Now. Why does this why does this happen and what's the what's the origins to this? Well, I think it's important to understand as you go back in history and thinking about the national team uh, that the U.S. actually beat England in the 1950 World Cup, not in the finals, but in um, in the group stage. But then the U.S. national team did not qualify for another World Cup until 1990. So you're talking about a 40-year span, 10 World Cups that the U.S. Uh, didn't even qualify into, uh, so they didn't even play. So let's think back to that term socialization that we used earlier in an earlier session to talk about how we uh, become fans of a team or become fans of a sport. If you recall, the socialization process involves things in our social environment, meaning usually other people, although sometimes it can be the media, uh, that will get us interested, uh, raise our knowledge, and get us interested in a particular sport or a particular team. So the effect of the U.S. not making the U.S. national team not making the World Cup for those 40 years between 1950 and 1990 means that there was two whole generations, uh, which could be your parents' generation and your grandparents' generation, that when they were growing up, the U.S. national team didn't even play in the World Cup, right? So as you can imagine, that significantly decreased any sort of interest in the game of soccer because the U.S. national team uh, was not at that elite level uh, of the nations participating in the World Cup. Now, something turned the tide of that relatively quickly. Besides the U.S. team making the World Cup finally again in 1990, uh, the U.S. hosted the World Cup in 1994. Uh, in different venues all across the country. And during that time, um, during that particular World Cup in 1994, a new attendance record was set here in the U.S. Uh, or the World Cup was in the U.S. and the attendance record overall for all World Cups was set in that 1994 World Cup held here in the U.S. and it still hasn't been broken. Uh, 
you know, why do you, why do you think that is? There was such little interest in the World Cup for such a long time in the United States, and then all of a sudden we qualify in in 1990, we host the World Cup in 1994, and we break these attendance records. Well, there's a couple different reasons. One major reason is that we have much more developed stadiums in terms of the number of stadiums and the size of those stadiums here in the U.S. than they do in other countries. So those World Cup games were played in large American football stadiums, which allowed for more seating and more people than stadiums in other parts of the world where the World Cup had previously been staged. Also, the U.S. is a, is a prime tourist destination for people outside uh, of America that want to come and visit, and us hosting the World Cup gives them a good reason uh, to come and do some tourism in, in addition to taking in some World Cup games. Um, so that's one interesting aspect of it. Um, so prior to that 1994 uh, hosting of us, uh, there was or hosting by us here in the U.S., there was very limited media coverage when the U.S. wasn't qualifying, right? And so thinking back to us talking about sport as a language, you can imagine that the, the fluency of the soccer language in the U.S. went down by a great amount during those 40 years that the U.S. didn't qualify. Then the U.S. hosting in 1994, as I mentioned, set a record for attendance, um, but also started uh, to turn the tide of that soccer fluency as a language around, right? Where a new generation started to get hooked on the sport uh, and decide that this this was a sport that they wanted to that they wanted to watch and they wanted to follow. A condition for us being awarded the World Cup in 1994 by FIFA was that we would restart our major professional uh, club league, uh, which became MLS and started play in 1996, I believe. So. While I said that lots of people came from all parts of the world to, to watch that World Cup in 1994, um, most of the ticket buyers were certainly Native Americans. Not Native Americans meaning Indians, but people, Americans who lived in the United States, right? So not foreigners coming in just to watch the World Cup and going home. And subsequently, in future World Cups, what has happened, even World Cups you know, the, the ones since 1994 that have been staged outside of the U.S., the, the number one group of ticket buyers or the number one nation outside of the host nation that buys tickets to the World Cup is, guess, it is, yes, it's the U.S. Um, so you might think, oh, it's England or Germany or... Um, uh, Argentina or Brazil that's just soccer crazy and surely they buy more tickets to the World Cup than Americans do uh, but that's not the case and again there's a few reasons for that one we have a very large population in the US not the largest in the world China India both have larger populations than we do uh, but we have a relatively large population here in the US which means more people to potentially uh, buy tickets we also have um, the most discretionary income and affluence uh, per capita still of pretty much any country in the world. So our middle class is of the type that has the means to save and then spend on a trip to South Africa or Brazil to see the World Cup, uh, see their team or our team, the U.S. team, compete in the World Cup. Uh, so. We, I have a short video here uh, of the U.S. Outlaws, which is the supporters group for the U.S. national team that we will take a couple minutes to watch and it'll give you a flavor uh, of the fandom and the excitement that has developed around the U.S. national team. U.S. 
U.S. soccer supporters group. Our mission here is to support the U.S. men's national team, but it's also here to bring fans to the game. 20 years ago, I think there was questions on whether or not we could support the the home games the way the sport should be supported. And American All Laws deserve a feather in the cap, a pat on their back, a pat on the butt, whatever you want for a lot of that. Man, we are in Phoenix, Arizona, supporting the United States men's national team playing Mexico. We do whole setup inside the stadium with the TIFO and the banners, and then at the same time outside, we're having a huge tailgate. And we just bring everybody into the stadium, and we just have a great time. And for 90 minutes, we're standing, and we're singing, and we're having a good time, and we're showing our passion and our love for the team. Our support, they feel on the field. The chance, the rigging of all of it, that's part of the game. These chants have meaning. And the more you give, the more they feel, the better they play, and the better the results. The support of the game is going in the right direction, and it's becoming more popular and done the right way, and actually legit. It's not a mom and pop and bring the kids shop anymore. It's bring your beers and, you know, let's get ready to party and really show support for the team, and that's what we should We have 121 chapters across the U.S. They're coming in all over the U.S. We have people coming from New York, Long Island. Came down from El Paso. From Valencia, California. San Diego. The eastern shore of Maryland. These people are, are kind of like your family that are part of this group. You see them at all U.S. games. And you get to meet new people that have the same interests as you and share the same love that you have for the game. The favorite part of the AO is just the camaraderie, you know, just the family that we have amongst here. Doesn't matter if you're, if you're from Texas, from Tucson, from California, we're all family, we're all AO family. What can Brazil expect? We are coming with 540 people on two chartered airplanes and we are going to bring the noise. Whoops. Let's go back to our... So you could see uh, lots of excitement around the U.S. national team. Um, certainly you've got some discretionary income there where you have people chartering a f uh, two different f uh, airplanes uh, to bring the supporters group uh, down to that World Cup that took place in Brazil a few years ago. Um, so let's transition from the ticket buyers to what about TV rights? So FIFA sells the TV rights uh, to different countries around the world, right? Or to different uh, TV stations in each country uh, around the world. And the rights that those TV stations are willing to pay to broadcast the World Cup is based on what? How does ESPN or Fox Sports determine how much they're willing to pay FIFA to broadcast the World Cup here in the US. Well, they're thinking about how much advertising money can I make back, make back, right? How much can I sell the advertisements for during the broadcast of the World Cup? They're making an estimate of that and then that's determining what their bid is uh, for the rights fee. The highest rights fee of any country to broadcast the World Cup is, again, here in the US. Um, so even though we might not think of the United States as being as soccer crazy as a lot of other countries around the world, because of the size of our country and the discretionary income associated with our country and the, some of those barriers starting to be overcome, first of which we just talked about being the fluency of the soccer language here in the U.S., right? The U.S. team is now national team has made the World Cup in several consecutive years. Our women's national team has been widely successful, which we'll talk more about in another session. Uh, and MLS has started to grow as well, right? So the fluency uh, of the soccer language in the U.S. has certainly started to pick up. So that's one of the barriers that has begun to start crumbling. And that took a while, though, because, again, I don't want to belabor this point, but I will mention one more time that that gap of 40 years means that 
you know, when you were kids or when I was a kid, um, you're most likely younger than me, but um, when I was a kid, my parents knew nothing about soccer, right? They were in that generation that grew up in between 1950 and 1990 when there was no soccer on TV, the U.S. wasn't qualifying for the national team, right? So they had no chance to socialize me into the sport of soccer. Right now, I'm within that first generation that has sort of grown up with a little bit better soccer fluency uh, in terms of speaking the language, at least as a spectator. Uh, and I'll pass some of that on to my kids, um, and they might be even more uh, into the sport of soccer, right? Because they're getting socialized into it a little bit more. You know, we're attending some FC Cincinnati games uh, together. Uh, so that's a socialization process that I myself uh, never went through and that's how sports build over generations right so now let's talk about we or we just finished talking about kind of world soccer or national team soccer um, what about national soccer meaning soccer within a specific country so clubs or franchises right if World Cup is so popular in the US why isn't the MLS even more popular. We're starting to see growth without a doubt, but it's certainly not as popular as other top divisions in many other countries around the world. We're going to watch another short video here, uh, which is an interview with MLS Commissioner uh, Don Garber, where he addresses some of that. The league has grown dramatically from its founding in 96. We only had 10 teams. There was a round of expansion in 2005, and then almost every year since. How do you compete with the more established story, maybe, leagues like you know La Liga or uh, Premier League? Well, our hope is that you're a fan of New York City uh, FC, you're a fan of Orlando City FC, or you know the Chicago Fire. And you also like watching Real Madrid. Fans want to be connected to a club in their town, and they want to paint their face, bang a drum, wave a field, a flag, go into their stadium and believe that it's their cathedral to celebrate uh, uh, the sport that they love. And you can only do that if you live in the U.S. and Canada through Major League Soccer, if you want to do it at the Division One level. How do you attract talent? What makes playing in MLS you know, appealing to someone who could maybe compete you know, well, you know, it starts with strategy, and our strategy is we want our league to be a league of choice for players. Obviously, you have to play, pay them well. You've got to provide them with the right environment, the best coaching, bring in David Beckham, get new television deals, uh, bring in new corporate partners, and that got us sort of to a new level. You mentioned David Beckham. That contract was, I think, reported $250 million. Did that turn the tide at all for MLS? Beyond even what he was paid, I think there's you know, unanimity that he was the tipping point for us from the original plan to what was became really MLS 2.0. This idea that we could attract world-class players, that we could have downtown stadiums. And David really was the driver of that because he sort of said, hey, I'm the most popular soccer player in the world, if not the best, because he uh, was not the best soccer player in the world at that time. And I believe in MLS. And then Thierry Henry came, who left Arsenal and was another world-class player. And then it just continued to, to roll. Uh, but I don't think we'd be where we are today if, uh, if David didn't decide that he was uh, ready to leave Madrid and come to L.A. I played soccer as a kid. So many young kids play soccer. Is that a built-in pipeline? Or do you guys, are you guys as a league also working on efforts to, you know, introduce the game to kids. When it comes to players, you know, it is very, very focused on building the soccer pyramid, having U8s and U10s and U14s and U18s and U20s, having them all sort of aspire to be a member of the first team. And that's many, 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 tens of millions of dollars of investment that our clubs are making in these academy programs. And uh, that wasn't part of our original plan. It all goes into the investment that is required to continue to sort of fulfill this dream of ours. All right, so you get some idea there of the commissioner's reaction to is La Liga or EPL a competitor to MLS? 
you know, at least publicly, he would argue, no, they're a complement to each other. Um, you know, that, that fans can watch those club uh, clubs in other countries uh, and also follow their local club here in the U.S. So what's been the traditional barrier then for uh, soccer? Because MLS is not the first league to make uh, a run at establishing major soccer uh, here in the U.S. Well, one of the issue is one of the issues is that our sports space here in the U.S. is very crowded, right? When we talked about hegemonic sports uh, in an earlier session, we talked about how you know we have professional basketball, we have professional football, American football, we have uh, hockey, we have baseball, uh, and and those are often considered our four major leagues, right? And depending on where you are in the country, uh, NASCAR might sneak into that. Uh, college football is incredibly popular. College basketball in certain areas is incredi incredibly popular. So it's a crowded hegemonic sports culture, and so that's made uh, another barrier for club soccer to overcome, to try and gather fans' attention, uh, money, and get fans to attach their identity uh, to a local soccer club. Another uh, hindrance that has since crumbled somewhat is that the media space uh, used to be limited, right? Um, until about 20 to 30 years ago, uh, you just had these four major networks, uh, actually for a while, three major networks, and then Fox came on, uh, was established. But you just had ABC, CBS, and NBC, uh, and they only devoted so much of their time to sports, right? And because of this uh, crowded sports culture that we have in the U.S., there wasn't much time for soccer. Uh, then you had Fox come along and add a fourth major network. Then you had the explosive growth of cable, right? Of course, ESPN being started in the early 80s, uh, and then ESPN2 and Fox Sports and you know all the other stations that have started with sports-only programming. And it created a lot more uh, broadcast media space um, that these lead, or that MLS could start to thrive in, right? So another issue um, with MLS or a barrier to club soccer here is that yes, World Cup soccer, soccer is really popular, but in some ways it's popular because of the nationalistic pride that gets uh, expended. So the hope is that from an MLS standpoint that People will be excited to cheer on our national team and in that process of watching those games and cheering on the national team as the national team gets better and better, that it will increase the fluency of the soccer language here in the U.S. and it will increase the interest in the sport and not just for nationalistic reasons. Um, that maybe people will start to follow their local club for reasons of city pride, right? So I might follow the national team uh, because I'm proud of the country but I might also follow my local city team because I'm proud of my city, right? And I think we're seeing a lot of that uh, with the rise of FC Cincinnati. And of course you have the issue of the MLS not being the best in the world. And we're not used to that in the U.S. Uh, so that's, that's another barrier that's pretty significant. In our other four major leagues, they're the best players in the world, right? There's not really a rival league at the same level anywhere in the world. All the best players come from all over the world to play here in our NHL or NBA or, um, or MLB. Uh, but in soccer, that's not necessarily the case, right? We have had some superstars come here, but as you heard the commissioner allude to, um, early on those superstars would come here and they would be toward the end of their career. Now that's starting to change a little bit, uh, but it's still certainly a barrier for MLS. Um, so not to be too remiss, I did go to a few soccer games when I was a kid and I actually found this nice Cleveland Force pennant. Would you look at that? I think that was an indoor soccer team. So I do want to give my parents some credit. They took me to a game or two, or maybe it was my uncle. He was more of a sports fan than my parents. Uh, so go Cleveland Force. I don't, I don't think they even exist, nor do I think their league exists anymore. Um, but hey, I thought I'd give them a little shout out. So part of this issue of soccer being every four year sport and a week in, a week out club sport is 
the soccer diffusion, meaning it diffusing from just being a, um, uh, a periodic sport to one that's a normal part of our culture, that becomes hegemonic to our sports culture. Uh, and not only does this rely on MLS, but this also um, is being fueled by other clubs outside of the U.S. that come here uh, to play games because they're trying to build up their U.S. fan base, right? In the same way that our leagues are trying to play internationally to build up their fan base outside of the U.S., we see some of the super clubs come here and play and try and build up uh, the fan base here. The International Champions Cup. Some of you might have even have attended a game in, during the International Champions Cup, which is an annual competition uh, outside of the normal European uh, club schedules where they'll come over, they'll play against each other, um, but here in the U.S., usually in American football stadiums, huge stadiums that will sell out. Uh, I think it was... Manchester United versus Real Madrid that several years ago played in Michigan Stadium and sold out Michigan Stadium, which is the biggest stadium here in the U.S., uh, and set a soccer record. Uh, and since the original International Champions Cup, it's been expanded to also have games uh, in China and Singapore as well as the U.S. Uh, and again, these are primarily teams from Europe, uh, big name clubs that you would recognize. Um, and the average attendance per match is really high. I mean, almost 50,000 fans per match uh, over these 20 or so matches um, between different teams uh, in these games uh, all over the country. So you are starting to see uh, that barrier come down to where people, large, large crowds are getting excited about more than just the national team playing, uh, even if it is uh, for clubs outside of the U.S. And now we're starting to see, of course, with, with Seattle's success uh, since they joined MLS and now recently Atlanta joining MLS and having really large crowds, topping 50,000 on a couple of occasions, uh, you're starting to see that, that trickle into our own club soccer uh, in MLS. So take a guess. What do you think the MLS average attendance is? So, so the mean number. Uh, well, it's around 19,000, uh, and it seems to go up a little bit every year. I think this number might be one or two years old, so it might be, uh, it might be just above 19,000 now. And uh, that puts it, believe it or not, within the top 10 soccer leagues uh, in the world. Um, so sometimes we think of MLS as being a little bit inferior to the English Premier League, Bundesliga in Germany, La Liga, uh, Serie A. Um, some of those other European leagues. Uh, and yes, it doesn't generate quite the attendance that gets generated there, but it's still a top 10 league uh, by attendance. And it's actually higher than NBA or NHL uh, average attendance, although that's somewhat misleading because they play less games in MLS. And of course, they play in outdoor stadiums that are a bit larger than the arenas of the NBA and NHL. Uh, but it seems like attendance is not the biggest uh, barrier or it's not really what's holding back MLS. Um, it's really something else that is the big barrier for MLS. Any guesses on that? I know you're saying, Dr. Cobb, this is a recording. If I guess, you can't even hear me. I know, I know, but I like discussion format. I like to give you a second to think about things within the video. Um, What's holding back MLS is not really attendance, it's TV ratings um, and getting media attention within, the, within our crowded hegemonic sport space. Um, they have broken through and gotten into ESPN. Uh, now you see games listed on the bottom line. You've started to see more and more highlights on SportsCenter. Um, EPL games uh, are broadcast more and more regularly. Um, it's pretty easy to get most of the EPL games, or at least the ones involving the major clubs uh, here in the U.S. And MLS has had their game broadcast schedule expanded. But it wasn't too long ago, just several years ago, uh, where the MLS Cup Final, the championship game on ESPN, drew about half a million viewers on ESPN, about another half a million on Unimas, uh, the Spanish language broadcaster at that time. Uh, and the average game broadcast uh, of MLS during the regular season was about 300,000, which is not 
great. Uh, to give you a point of comparison, uh, there's some major clubs uh, that will play their regular season games on the NBC Sports Network or on Fox Sports 1, uh, Manchester United versus Manchester City, which is the Manchester Derby, uh, generated 1.2 million people. Uh, so that's double uh, the amount of viewers for the MLS Cup in that same year. Liverpool versus Chelsea was about 1.1 million in ratings um, or in viewers. So you can see... Um, while the MLS is getting better, it still has a little ways to go to catch up with the popularity of um, the EPL games, even here in the U.S. Here's a chart uh, that you can check out that kind of emphasizes what I was talking about, um, that yes, MLS um, is not at the level of some of these other leagues, but at the same time, it's, it seems to be expanding, and some of those barriers that we just talked about seem to be breaking down. Uh, you can see that this is several years old, uh, but it gives you an idea of uh, the NFL does really well, best league in the world from an attendance standpoint. Um, and then you see Germany, Germany's Premier League, which is Bundesliga, and the EPL uh, in third place there. You see Australian Rules Football does really well attendance-wise. Uh, and then you see our baseball league, you see Canadian football, that probably uh, surprises some of you. And then you see a few other uh, football leagues there before MLS comes up uh, in the number 12 spot. Um, and then you see basketball, the NBA, and the NHL right behind it. So, um, so it's growing, I guess is the point. And we are starting to see, I think, a shift um, in some of those barriers coming down. So let's talk about one last thing here as it relates to sports becoming international and certainly what we heard the commissioner talking about with Beckham coming to the U.S. Let's compare Beckham's move to the U.S. to Nowitzki, uh, who was a great player in Germany uh, playing in the professional league, then got drafted by the Mavericks and came over here, of course, and played, had a great career for the Dallas Mavericks. Um, so what's the difference between these two effects? Let's think about this from a from a sports marketing and business standpoint. So on the, in the one instance, you have Nowitzki, who is the best player in a particular country, go to another country, the US, where the best league in the world is, right? And that move then created lots of popularity for the NBA back in Germany, right? People wanted to watch NBA broadcasts, specifically ones with Nowitzki, but even games that he wasn't involved in, the NBA really caught on in Germany uh, when Nowitzki came over uh, and played for the Mavericks. The difference being that in Beckham's instance, he went from a country where, now granted I know he was playing for Real Madrid when he transferred to, to the Galaxy, but he went being a native of the country England where soccer is already incredibly popular, right? He left that country, came to a league where the sport was less popular, um, and in an effort to make the sport more popular here where the league was based, right? You see the difference there, right? Nowitzki is leaving his home country where the, lead, the top league is not really that popular, but he's coming over here to play in the top league and the top league becomes more popular back where he came from in Germany, right? Whereas Beckham's leaving his home country where it's already really popular, coming over to play in a lesser league, trying to make that league more popular uh, in the place that he's going to. So a little bit of a difference there. So when we think about Beckham, um, what might be sort of a, a reverse analogy, if you will, um, if, say, Kershaw came uh, or went over to England and played in a baseball league over in England, right? He's one of the best players in the world. He would be leaving the popular league here, going to that other country to try and make the sport more popular over in England. Same thing if LeBron left uh, here and went and played in a basketball league in England, right? That would be kind of the reverse geographic effect. Um, in terms of Nowitzki, uh, what would be a reverse, reverse analogy? Uh, well, that would be uh, somebody from the U.S., maybe uh, a driver. Um, say a motorsports driver going and being highly successful in Formula One, right? Formula One is a sport that's already popular outside of the U.S. And if somebody from the U.S. went and 
became world champion in Formula One, that might increase the popularity of Formula One back here in the U.S., right? Uh, that would be an analogy or a reverse geographic analysis, analogy for that Nowitzki effect. Now, the media plays a big role here, right? Because if we didn't have such a large sports media uh, conglomerate, worldwide media, we wouldn't even know who Beckham was here in the U.S., right? And on the other side, in the Nowitzki effect, uh, if we didn't have such a large media uh, conglomerate or worldwide media, uh, people back in Germany wouldn't be able to follow Dirk's progress here in the NBA. They wouldn't be able to get games, uh, NBA games back in Germany, right? So the growth in the, the, second, or the second globalization, that digital globalization that the authors talk about in the Game of the World book are key to both of these effects. Right? So that we already knew how big of a star David Beckham was even before he came to the U.S. because of that digital revolution and the global nature of sports. Same thing in, Now in Nowitzki's case. We didn't know who Nowitzki was here, but back in Germany they already knew about the NBA and they were able to then start following NBA games because of that digital revolution and the ability um, to have NBA games in Germany, which didn't exist um, several decades ago. Um, so hopefully that gives you some idea of how sports can span borders in two different effects. You have countries go, or uh, stars going to play in other countries, but you have two different sort of effects as it relates to the spread of sports popularity. That is it for this session.